I'm Nancy Rosenblum, uh, and this is the panel that I call the moral psychology of climate change. I observed to Danielle that our... We can hear you. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, okay. That, that's, that would help. Um, I observed to Danielle that our first session of this uh, anniversary was a panel on the end of life. And we're ending with a panel on the end of collective life, or it's, or it's, it's a possibility. I mean, as, Ze as Zeke told us, we can't hope for individual immortality, but we can hope for collective immortality. That is the continuity of the human species. So I'm going to uh, give an introduction, and then we'll have three little talks. A new species, Homo sapiens, emerged maybe 200,000 years ago, and none of the usual constraints of habitat or geography seem to check them. We've altered the composition of the atmosphere, we've acidified the ocean, we've redistributed life around the earth. We've precipitated what Elizabeth Colbert called in a wonderful book, The Sixth Extinction, a profound loss of biodiversity in a geologically insignificant amount of time. Estimates are that a third of all freshwater mollusks, a third of sharks and rays, a quarter of all mammals, a fifth of all reptiles, and a sixth of all birds are headed towards oblivion. What about us? Will human ingenuity outrun what human ingenuity has set in motion? We face an acute, what I call, world-altering scientific, political, and moral challenge, what Hegel might call a world historical moment. I'm going to introduce our panel in just a minute, but I'm postponing introductions with the permission of my colleagues. Um, and I'm going to take some time now as chair because I want to set these talks against the background of what I think moral and political theorists have written on this subject and above all what they haven't written because I think all three of these talks are trying to break some new ground. I thought it would be of interest to you to quickly map the land of ethics work on this subject. But I have another uh, uh, reason for this survey. You should consider it a recruitment mechanism, an invitation for you all to turn your attention to what I think is a subject that we need more good work on. So what do moral and political theorists have to say about climate change? One path, and it's probably the path you know best, is comparatively well trodden and has been for some time. And that's the family of questions that goes under the name uh, climate justice. The work ranges from global distributive justice to the related theme of intergenerational justice. Scholars study differentials in the cause and effect of climate change and inequality within and between uh, the global north and south. They assign moral responsibility to the agents of harmful effects. They debate the fair allocation of costs and compensation for climate mitigation, sometimes tracking and sometimes separating who pays from who emits. And in this connection, moral and political theorists also explore how we measure uh, the most vulnerable nations or people. They ask whether emissions should be considered alone or under a broader distributive uh, justice framework and so on. There's a second path that um, moral and political theorists have taken. It's less well known, I think. And that is reflections on the transformation of values that would seem to be required by any major project of mitigating fossil fuel emissions. That is, how climate change alters standard thinking about the good life or human flourishing, and it's captured, I think, in Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical on climate change, which was directed at every person living on the planet and called for what he called ecological conversion. And you should recognize this set of questions as a version of Rousseau and every radical inquiry into the problem of having a second nature, right? How can men and women who are raised in a fossil fuel environment and who expect ongoing uh, economic growth be transformed to accept a new regime of sustainability? What are the green virtues? Does addressing climate change entail identification as global citizens? What's this capacity called resilience that's everywhere out there in the climate literature? And surprisingly often, I found a climate catastrophe, catastrophe is represented as an opportunity to repair our ethical failures, as a kind of revitalization, even as an opportunity for collective greatness. It's an odd tag on to this literature. The philosophy of history has opened up a third path, how climate change requires us to think differently about time and scale. The scale of change has spurred the reintroduction of the notion of species being, a focus on humanity's common biological basis. And the time frame has altered historical thinking as well. Climate change is cast in terms of an epic and geological time called the Anthropocene. And in some respects, this is interesting to me, this turn to the philosophy of history isn't new. If you think back to Enlightenment theories uh, of history, they identified human agents as the agents of 
world historical change. They identified the specific historical and technological moments. They identified the dynamic of change. They almost, to a man, characterized their own moment as the you know, unique moment, right, to which we've come to a new form of knowledge and understanding of ourselves, and then they argued for a progressive outcome. Well, philosophers uh, now see the chasm separating us from Enlightenment mindsets widened by a new disconnect between past and future that's more dramatic, really, than anything imagined outside of apocalyptic religion, and the philosophy of history is challenged by this possibility of human futurelessness. And finally, there's the path to studying climate change that is closest to many of our concerns, but nonetheless, I think, interestingly, is the path least taken, and that's the path of politics and democratic theory. So let me give you an abbreviated list of what I think we need from democratic theory, that is, from you. First of all, what do alternative democratic theories, epistemic or deliberative or electoral or participatory, have to say about political action on climate change? Has it changed the considerations? The problem of a pol policy so closely tied to scientific uncertainty. The problem of long-term commitment, really long-term commitment. And then to reverse the question, how do these frameworks, how are these different <coughs> democratic frameworks challenged by climate matters? What are the strengths and weaknesses of each that are revealed by the climate problem? Second, we have very little so far on the related problem of the role of scientific expertise in democratic dec decision making generally and in climate change specifically. Although Eric and Dennis and I were recently on a dissertation defense with one of our students who's written a wonderful, what will be book, book on this. But looking around, we can see three different sort of states of mind vis-a-vis -vis scientific authority. There's deference to it, there's rejection, uh, in this and in other contexts, a denial of scientific authority as elitist or captured or partisan or the product of a conspiracy. And there's scientism, meaning confidence that scientific progress, like geoengineering, will provide the answer to the problems that science created. So I think we need a better understanding of how to represent and assess scientific claims in the face of uncertainty. There's some good literature on how scientists communicate or fail to communicate what they understand, the translation of science for a consuming public, but we need more. That is, we need some attempts. When these attempts to um, address scientific, the difficulty of science with better communication of facts, when the communication of information doesn't change people's minds or mobilize or go far enough for democratic policy, should scientists uh, combine their expert knowledge with political knowledge communicating with the public? Climate scientists, I think, are in the frontier of thinking about the public responsibility of professionals they take on the obligation not only to inform but also to mobilize, and there are interesting questions about this. And finally, we also need work, I think, from democratic theorists on the constraints on political decision making and obstacles to commitment for the long run that are imposed by the electoral cycle, by political time, and that brings me to our panel because that's Eric uh, Beerbohm's subject. The failure to respond to climate change owes as much to the belief structures of lawmakers, he argues, as to political structures. We should pay no less attention to how we treat epistemic obstacles than we do to institutional structures and veto points. Allison is going to take on another lacuna in democratic theory, and that's the role of emotion in climate change, in particular fear. Fear, I think, enters everywhere in this context. We see the manufacture of fear to produce resistance to scientific consensus and public policy. We see the normalization of fear to produce complacency. And we see the possibility of rational fear to motivate and sustain action for change. And this is Allison's subject. She's going to propose, I think, a model. You do this in this paper, right? A model of civic fear that combines elements of fear and hope. And finally, I'm going to talk to the aspect of climate change that may be the most familiar to you because it touches you where you live. And that's adaptation. That is, it's, perf uh, it's personally close, and, but it's, I think it's the most glaring gap in what moral and political theorists have had to say at climate change. We've had well, close to nothing to say about the precautionary measures and the recovery measures and the transformative measures that really are starting to go around, on all around us. The mitigation of fossil fuel emissions is analyzed and reported. It dominates international conventions. It inspires science and social science and philosophy. But adaptation has been, I think, rightly characterized as the poor derided cousin of emissions reduction. And this disproportion is understandable, I think. Replacing fossil fuels with clean energy and other measures to slow our approach to critical temperature rises 
is in fact the ultimate adaptation. But that said, people need safety and saving from the disasters that are coming and uh, will come again. And once we look at responding to and anticipating the effects of change and, uh, and adaptation, every single normative question we talk about raises its head in a big way. Because adaptation is in part, obviously, a question of distributive justice. The risks and effects of climate disasters and patterns of recovery are always differentially distributed. What moral criteria decide on what harm should be addressed, which areas should be rebuilt, who must move and where to, what ways of life uh, of all or parts of cities or towns or rural areas have to be altered, and who should pay. And interestingly, I think that the, the several principles proposed for global justice in emissions, polluters pay, to take a simple example, translate very imperfectly in the adaptation context. The distributive question is complicated for adaptation too because it's, uh, it's not contained within jurisdictional boundaries, especially when, as in the United States, the legal authority for decisions and the capacity to fund decisions are divided among local, state, and federal governments. Our federalism itself is an obstacle. And finally, adaptation, I think, raises the question that's at the heart of political theory, and that's who should decide on flood-proofing the New York City subways or saving the Chesapeake Island Tangier or moving an Alaska village or restricting coastal developments in Maine. And can political arrangements encourage decision makers and citizens to look past building coastal barriers to the larger challenge of mobilizing uh, us to address climate change more broadly? And that my paper is going to be about what I, the moral psychology of adaptation as it begins to move into the forefront of climate awareness. Okay, we'll start with Eric. Well, yesterday, uh, Dennis called on us. Not, he didn't announce a war on deception, uh, but I believe he urged us to investigate the structure of truthiness. And I, as usual, I feel like I'm following in his path here. Uh, I want to look at uh, climate denialism um, and mass climate denialism uh, in particular. We've all seen uh, the basic data, uh, the partisan gaps between those who believe that the increase in the Earth's temperature over the last century is due more to the effects of human activities and natural, or natural changes in the environment. You have a nice uh, 39 percentage point gap there. More recently, um, Dan Kahan has shown that uh, the more uh, different parties know in terms of how they score on ordinary uh, science intelligence scores, further polarize them, polarize them. So scientific understanding is inversely correlated with beliefs in climate change for conservatives. Um, and those in the top percentile of scientific knowledge are m most likely to be what I'm going to call disbelievers in this talk. But that kind of shows my first initial worry, that I think that the term denialism as a concept has grown far out of proportion. Um, recently in Scientific American, uh, there was a suggestion that even someone who grudgingly admitted the problem while scrambling to avoid addressing it should be called a denier. The term also evokes uh, Holocaust denial, quite probably intentionally. Um, but I think there's something missing when we look at this picture. I think that there is an important epistemic distinction between denialism of any claim and disbelief uh, or refraining from believing. And I think that if we think about the difference between someone who denies a fact versus someone who is in denial, that's a useful distinction. There's a really impressive book by the sociologist Kari Norsgaard. She studies a rural community in Norway and finds uh, during an unusually warm winter and she finds what she calls uh, socially organized denial, by which information about climate scientists is known, but it's not, doesn't find its way into their actual way of life. I don't think this is denialism. I think this is in denial, and I want to give that the term disbelief in this talk. But if you look through the polls, and I poured through them, there's not a single question I found that actually tests whether someone actively has denies. I do not, it's not that I do not hold the belief. Uh, which is generally what's asked. That's refraining from believing. The question I'm looking for is whether someone says, I believe uh, that humankind has nothing or very little to do uh, with these changes in climate. I, I test you to find a poll that actually tests that. And so what I want to do in these three parts is to look at the structure of climate denialism, disbelief as I'll call it, as I think is a more humane term. I want to look at multiplier effects that are making it worse and certain kinds of interventions this points to mostly research intervention. We need to know more about the structure of this disbelief. So think about uh, the two of us if we're having a conversation about climate change. I deny its reality. I also deny taking action, in part because of its denial of its reality. 
Now, when you respond to me to this suite of responses, one empirical, one normative, uh, your reaction isn't merely forensic. I assume you don't just walk through the premises I'm relying upon. It's likely in this room you'll say, you don't just say, why didn't you form that belief with more care? You might some say something like, how could you believe that? Um, and yet none of you, I, I believe, are volunteerists, right? You don't think that we can move around our beliefs like furniture, but you believe we can perhaps be responsible for how we place ourselves in environments that expose us indirectly to having our beliefs changed in perhaps subtle ways. So I want to distinguish uh, denying uh, this claim about the connection between human, humans and climate change from refraining from believing. And notably, philosophers as ranging from Bernard Williams and Robert Nozick have held that there is an important normative asymmetry between these two epistemic postures. Uh, they've said that holding a pleasant belief in the face of strong evidence that's countervailing is objectionable. Uh, but refraining from holding an unpleasant belief that's well supported by the evidence might be less objectionable or possibly unimpeachable. Uh, so distinguish this. Someone, they believe when available reasons uh, against what is strongly supported, uh, that reasons support its falsity. So I think that seems to be the greater sin. Compare that to epistemically. Compare that to refraining from believing what is available uh, and that's tr that uh, reason strongly support its truth, but you simply don't hold a view. Nozick writes, it is clear that many things are irrational to believe. It is less clear that some beliefs are so credible that they are mandated by rationality. He's anticipating a very strong form of what you might call epistemic permissivism here. And he's drawing upon what I take to be the epistemic equivalent of the act-omission distinction. Um, I'm amazingly giving you the first one who brings in a trolley problem, as far as I can tell, in this conference. It had to happen, so someone had to do it. Um, and in the traditional worry, many of us would not push the fat man. But if the fat man is doing a dance on the bridge, and we decide that we're not going to reach out our hand, some of us might entertain saving the five people by uh, omitting action. I'm not saying that's a universal judgment. But we, you know, there, there is deontic residence in the distinction between omitting and acting. And now I want to look at two possible accounts of what's happening in climate disbelief. The first one, which I think is the more common one, is that it is a kind of faux disbelief. right? And it's simply a partisan, dri driven by partisanship. It's been called partisan cheerleading by many political scientists. Um, so think of analogous domains. Democrats will say that inflation rose under Reagan. Uh, Republicans will deny that. Uh, Republicans will say, are more likely than Democrats, to say the deficit rose during the, the Clinton administration. When we test these people's views and we, as we'll see later, offer to pay them, it seems like they just they don't know the answer to these questions. They don't remember, but they're simply cheerleading their own party. And you might think, in particular, when someone is asked by a pollster their beliefs, that the mistake is that they're not actually trafficking in propositional comment. We assumed that they were uttering beliefs, but that's not what they thought they were doing when they were interrupted at dinner time. Uh, maybe it's a suspended context. That's how it's perceived, and that reflect, may reflect the expressive value of the words exchange being non-propositional. So how have political scientists tested that? They have offered, I, I don't want to call it a bribe in light of Larry and the institutional corruptionists here, uh, but they offer a small payment if someone gets the answer correct. And they didn't, they haven't done this, uh, I think quite unfortunately, in, on climate disbelief, but they've done it on the kind of questions I raised earlier, whether uh, it what inflation raised or lowered during Reagan, whether the deficit raised or lowered uh, during Clinton. And they, they found that it's not that people got more accurate, because in this domain, they didn't really know the truth anyway. But they were less likely to fall upon partisan party line responses. So that's a sort of research project. It would be useful to know how much it would take to pay people if, if that would actually alter fundamental disbeliefs about climate change. I, I'd like to see that research done. But perhaps, and if suppose that even offering small fees, uh, their beliefs were robust, their announced beliefs. Here's a second possible account of what's happening. Maybe there is genuine disbelief uh, about, and that's also mediated by partisanship. Um, and we often hear stories about Democrats, and Republicans living in different separate epistemic realities or bubbles and all seeing their world via different perceptual screens. And so one hypothesis of what's happening, uh, and this is an example of indirect belief formation, is that if someone is worried that the kind of policy actions that will be called for, uh, they just assume they will be basically liberal policies. They'll involve more regulation. They foresee that consequence downstream of an argument. They don't want to embrace that. Uh, well, without perhaps deliberately fabricating or altering their belief, they're going to find pressure to alter uh, empirical beliefs about the world. And I'm not claiming this is meant to be deliberate, uh, but there is some evidence supporting this in a recent study, in a manipulation, Campbell and Aaron Kay, 
what they did was they introduced a different frame. When they talked about policy actions, they mentioned free market actions. So they led people to think that uh, there were other alternatives besides simple liberal, as it was associated, regulation. When they did that, uh, they found uh, that people uh, were much more in line with uh, their democratic uh, respondents in acknowledging the reality of climate change. That was just happening within seconds of introducing that new frame. Now, I'll let you think of what's happening there, but it's, it strikes you that there's evidence that there's actually knowledge of what is behind this belief. And so it might go against the theme of the article, which says, well, this is solution aversion, that they don't really believe this. Um, it may be that this is quite unwitting. It's a genuine belief, but it's a very soft belief, and it can be altered in ways uh, that, that I think I find quite surprising. Let me now and secondly mention two what I'm going to call multipliers in line with the line that all politics is local. Uh, the first one, which I'm sure some of you have seen, uh, the local warming effects uh, that, that people experience when you ask them uh, to state their confidence in the reality of global warming. Um, when they perceive the day to be warmer than usual, they then overestimate the past 10 years or 10 days, um, and that leads them to an increased belief and increased worry or decreased worry in global warming. This seems like a mistake, right, that someone would base their judgment in that way. We saw it glaringly with uh, uh, Senator Jim Inhofe when he held that snowball in 2014, and he actually ended up throwing it uh, in the Senate uh, to show that climate, ch climate change was a hoax or laughable. Uh, but what hasn't been done, and I think this is an important test of the authenticity of disbelief, um, you might have hypotheses that people uh, who denied the empirical premise about climate change uh, if you ask them, if you, if you prime them about that, and then you ask them to report their local weather the past week, that they would report the weather as cooler, as an attempt to connect up their own personal phenomenological experience of the weather and their own beliefs. Uh, that also is research that I would love to see done. There is some evidence in the current research on local climate effects that that is happening, but I, I wouldn't say it's decisive yet. Uh, the second multiplier, um, is the fact that 36% of meteorologists, who are the great translators of weather, experience climate disbelief. So they only do 6% better than the average. Uh, most of them, many of them carry PhDs. And um, Nancy mentioned a, a graduate thesis recently defended. Uh, this is coming out of a, a real breakthrough undergraduate thesis. I just had a chance to play a, a, a role in giving an award to. Cloudy with, with a chance of change. This undergraduate is a Harvard undergraduate meteorologist, meteorologist who found and tried to offer a theory of why there was so much skepticism among this community. And what he claims is that there are epistemic divides between climate scientists and meteorologists which are significant, that they live in very different worlds and they have very different incentive structures, that meteorologists don't get the idea of peer review they work uh, in the day. They don't understand the, these three to six month turnarounds. But I think more importantly, they focus on uncertainty uh, when they're making their forecasts because after all, if they get it wrong, uh, your family visits the beach and complains to them. They have immediate feedback when they blow their forecast. And this, it's done very well and shows the incentive structure is different and that affects how they view forecasting and uncertainty. And it might be behind uh, part of the puzzle of why you could have such widespread beliefs when people who are credentialed authorities are acknowledging it one way or another in their own, in their own reporting. So finally, in the last uh, five minutes I have left, I want to talk about what might follow from my call from better understanding this disbelief structure. What are some interventions? The first one, uh, make, keep a simple distinction in mind, I think it's very tempting when we do roll call votes on pol climate policy or we look at mass opinion uh, to clump together the disbelievers, as I've called them, and the quietists. Uh, I'd simply mean the quietists are ones who deny that we should act but accept the reality of uh, climate change. And um, so these two groups are guilty, possibly, of different kinds of violations of rationality. You might say that the violation of the disbelievers is what Tim Scanlon calls substantive rationality. Uh, they are failing to respond uh, rationally to a set of evidence and so they adopt a belief, uh, maybe it's for convenience, maybe not. That's importantly different than the quietest response. That's a kind of structural irrationality, as, as Tim calls it, right? They, uh, the, the, the sin here is that people are irrational when they believe that P, but they refuse to rely upon P in their further reasoning, whether theoretical or practical. And so uh, the, uh, uh, the quietists are simply not acting upon beliefs they announce that they hold. And if you aren't, 
as we looked at earlier, an epistemic permissivist about these kind of things, you might think you have to follow the argument where it leads you, and it leads you to a normative conclusion. So if there are different irrationalities at stake, we need to just keep quite apart the different treatments that we might respond to them. And so this might even apply in a cyclical way, uh, or certainly in an ag aggregative way when you look at, at Congress. Um, if, for those of you who, are, who enjoy discursive dilemmas, you could have a Congress, just very simplified, have it be one-third disbelievers, one-third quietists, and one-third activists. By activists, I mean people who want to act on climate change in some real and sincere way. And uh, you could have, if they were divided evenly, a situation where if you simply added up individual votes, you would have inaction. Um, but if you took the collective, the collective actually would share a belief uh, that we ought to act. And it really matters, so how you understand aggregation in this kind of case. Uh, I wouldn't say the Congress is exactly mapping in this way, but it's not, it's not far from what you might realistically imagine our current US Congress looks like if you disaggregate it more clearly the outright disbelievers from the quietists. The second distinction I want to draw in terms of further interventions is further distinguishing between what I'm going to call concerned and unconcerned beliefs, but it's really inspired by V.O. Key's, uh, I think, less illuminating distinction between what he called directive and permissive opinions. So the way to test whether someone's opinion is directive is that it's tied to their future action. It's tied to their intentional structure. And the classic way to ask about that is to ask them a question about action and then ask them a follow-up question, would you care if we acted in this way? Do you really care about the consequences you just announced? A very simple question. Um, and the most uh, alarming I've seen was the second Gulf War when among 71% of those who supported the war over the past three months, 41% admitted they did not care whether the United States went to war. They wanted us to go to war, but they didn't really care. And amazingly, this, a smaller percentage, but still a non-trivial one, who believe we shouldn't go to war, were asked as a follow-up, would you care if we went to war? And some percentage of them, it wasn't 40, it was under 20, said, I would not care. Let's call these unconcerned beliefs. Uh, they, they're terrifying, I think. <laughs> um, but we often think, after we ask someone their belief, how confident are you in that belief? And that's an important question to get a sense of. But there's a separate question here. <laughs> Uh, kind of Harry Frankfurt's old question about how much do we care? And I think that would be useful. Um, how much, how concerned are, is this swath of climate disbelievers? What kind of questions could we ask to bring out this level of care? I think that would be useful to know. I don't think we know it. Finally, I want to talk about um, the tendency in climate change debates to think about raising the stakes, uh, which we naturally do, and often we do with great scientific backing. But there's an obvious risk when we raise the stakes, and that just kind of bring out the literature many of you know on epistemic injustice. There's been a special move recently to bring out, uh, you bring out leaders of low-lying island countries, and you have them speak about their plight, right? So here's Tony De Broom, a foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, and they're being brought out uh, to speak on behalf of it. But if you believe some of the literature, this mix of psychological and philosophical literature on epistemic injustice, you might find that in policy debate, those with the highest stakes are liable to be treated that they, that they lack knowledge. They're discounted because they are the high stakeholders. Why is this? It might be philosophical. It might be that we actually have some implicit view that if the stakes are very high, knowledge, knowledge is going to be a higher bar to pass. Some people have held this view in the pragmatic encroachment literature. But even if you think that's a uh, a faulty literature, there's psychological backing that when we see someone advocating for something that uh, they personally have a high stake in, we will suppress the amount of credence we attribute to them. So this might suggest that uh, there are reasons to be careful bringing out people who are the highest stakeholders. It might lead them to be discounted in ways that would be perhaps surprising. Um, finally, and this is the most speculative thing on the issue of stakes, I suspect that when we think about the classic way that pragmatic encroachment works. We tell someone, um, are you sure that ice is solid enough? You know? There is an implicit bias we have in favor of inaction. That is, uh, well, I, perhaps I shouldn't walk on the ice. Well, perhaps I shouldn't use that ladder. That we often tie, are you sure? This kind of raise for the bar of knowledge is often implied uh, connected to uh, inaction. And yet, when we raise the stakes in climate change, we're, of course, trying to achieve the opposite. And I just wonder if we could do more psychological work to find out whether that bias is, 
is part of what's happening when we tend to freeze up and there's some basis behind it that is tied to our ordinary life. So I want to end by saying just to plead that we take seriously the structure of this climate uh, belief, uh, the kind of truthiness that we were called for yesterday, and, um, and, and simply this is my wish list of the kind of research and philosophical work we might do. Thank you. I want to change gears, but not too much, and talk to you a little bit about fear in the climate change debate. I came to this topic by working on the role of apocalyptic imagery and rhetoric in politics. And of course, a lot of apocalyptic imagery and rhetoric have, has been used to scare people into taking action on climate change. So let's start with a big question. The big question is how can we motivate individual and collective action and mobilization on climate change? Now, for decades, scientists, policymakers, and activists have tried to do this with information, with facts about the causes and consequences of climate change. But this information deficit model, as it's called, has had pretty depressing results. As the science on climate change has become more settled, as more information has been made public, as more campaigns have emerged to disseminate this information, the concern and motivation of citizens of wealthy, advanced democracies has not increased in anything like a proportional way. In fact, there have been long periods, you know, multi-year periods through the 2000s where concern decreased. Now, in response, scholars and climate change communicators have started to focus on the role of emotions. No, no, that's just, just to give you a sense of the kind of bombarding us with information. Um, now, in response, scholars and climate change communicators have started to focus on the role of emotions, how emotions can serve as an affective bridge between the cognitive work of understanding causes and consequences of climate change and the behavioral responses required for mitigation and adaptation. Now, of all the emotions, fear has received the most attention. And the promise of fear appeals in the climate change debate is that they make the threat salient to people. But fear appeals have been subject to a number of criticisms and I'm going to focus on three, that they are manipulative or that they are instances of fear mongering, that they are antithetical to democratic and civic values, and that they are counterproductive. Now I'm going to try and advance three claims to you today. The first is that the salience effects of fear appeals are especially valuable in the climate change case. The second is that climate change fear appeals may be better protected from the standard worries about the political uses of fear than their critics seem to think. And the third, that there is a broadly Aristotelian model of civic fear that begins to show us what it might look like for us to fear well. Now let's start with what a fear appeal is. Fear appeal is a message that attempts to persuade the recipient that there is a threat that is severe that they are susceptible to that threat, that there are effective responses that are well within the recipient's power or even easy for them to undertake. Now, fear appeals are common in public health campaigns. And a classic example is the 1980s Australian television campaign to increase AIDS awareness. It depicts a grim reaper bowling a ball that gathers speed, knocking over 10 human pins. This is accompanied by a voiceover. At first, only gays and IV drug users were being killed by AIDS, but now we know every one of us could be devastated by it. The message, as the ad goes on, is that the threat of AIDS is severe, you are susceptible, there's an effective response action, monogamous sex, condom use, and that these actions are well within your power to undertake. But of course, fear appeals are also the emotional currency of much of the climate change debate. Consider, for instance, Al Gore's strategy in his intervention surrounding an inconvenient truth. In a Vanity Fair article that accompanied the release of the film, he tried to convince us that there is a severe threat, there is a, as he put it, a true planetary emergency, 
that we, or at, the, at least those we love and with whom we have close affective ties are susceptible. He tells us this could all be set in motion in the lifetime of children already living. That there's an effective response. Um, Gore's focus is overwhelmingly on uh, corporations and policy, investment in clean energy, corporate emissions reductions, et cetera. And he tries to engender a sense of self-efficacy, at least on the part of political and corporate actors, by telling them that these actions are well within their power to undertake. Now, the promise of fear appeals is that they increase the salience of a threat. And this is especially valuable, I think, for reasons that we can all easily apprehend in the climate change case. A threat whose causes are complex, whose effects are spatially and temporally distant, both attributes that can prevent an issue from becoming salient for those best placed to take action. But even if climate change were to become salient for people like us, it must compete with other issues. For instance, terrorist attacks, economic downturns for our attention. And psychologists and climate change communication scholars have found evidence that people have a finite pool of worry. That as we worry more about one kind of risk, our concern about other risks goes down. This helps to explain why concern about climate change dips around 2001 and dips again during the financial crisis. Now, perhaps for these reasons, it's comforting that actually there's a wealth of empirical evidence that climate change fear appeals do increase the salience of the issue for people. The problem gets more attentive focus um, from those who are presented with terrifying and horrific images of climate change's effects than those who aren't. But in spite of their acknowledged salience effects, fear appeals have been criticized on a number of grounds. The first is that they are manipulative, that they amount to fear mongering. Take this concern to be, the, in a most general sense, any concern about fear mongering is that, it's, uh, that the fear appeal is trying to elicit fear in circumstances where rational moral agents would otherwise experience no fear. Now, some fear appeals certainly do this. Think of television news coverage of violent crime in the 1990s. There was, over the course of the 90s, a 600% increase in American network news stories on murder, and there were worries about violent young super predators. All of this as rates of violent crime were actually declining in America. Now, this kind of fear mongering relies on predictable forms of human bias encouraging us to overestimate the likelihood of violent crime and to, for instance, support tougher anti-crime legislation. But it's not clear that that's what's going on in the case of climate change fear appeals. In the climate change case, absent any sort of communicative or deliberative intervention, many of us are subject to a range of cognitive and, as um, Eric pointed out, partisan and other biases, um, also to temptations to motivated reasoning that cause us to either ignore or underestimate the risks posed by climate change. So rather than aiming to elicit our cognitive biases, many climate change fear appeals are actually trying to overcome them. So I'm not sure that the fear mongering worry is as pronounced in this case. Now, a second criticism of fear appeals is that they're inconsistent with democratic values, that they close off deliberation and debate, the kind of deliberation and debate required for meaningful consent to political aims. Now, some even think that this is built into the very structure of fear appeals, that they are, as some philosophers have put it, coercively dichotomous, that they force a choice between succumbing to a terrible threat on the one hand and accepting the proposed means of averting the threat on the other. Now, some fear appeals certainly do this. Think of McCarthyism, presented Americans with a coercively dichotomous choice between collective destruction on the one hand and conformity to the demands of the security state on the other. And there are certainly many climate change fear appeals that have something like this, this structure. But it's not clear that this is a necessary fe feature of fear appeals generally or climate change fear appeals in particular. Seems just as possible for a fear appeal to juxtapose a single threatening outcome on the one hand with a range of options that might avert the outcome on the other. 
And just which option to choose within that range can be the subject of both elite and popular deliberation. And that actually seems like precisely what is already going on in the more productive sectors of the climate change debate. Now, the criticism with the most serious teeth, I think, is that fear appeals may be counterproductive in the climate change case. There's substantial empirical evidence suggesting that while terrifying arguments and images may increase the salience of a particular threat, they can also prompt a sense of powerlessness, fatalism, and disengagement on the part of recipients. Faced with terrifying and often apocalyptic representations of the effects of climate change, many conclude, not entirely without good reason, that any actions they take will be futile. They become paralyzed, or worse, resigned. Now, <laughs> The question, though, is must climate change fear appeals have this effect? I don't think so. There's a lot of evidence from other do research on fear appeals in other domains that suggests that fear appeals are motivationally effective when they are paired with recommendations that elicit and support the recipient's agency, either as an individual or as part of a collective. But I would say that the three criticisms I've, I've run through here do point us to some criteria for what it might mean to fear well. It would mean that we fear in a way that is non-manipulative, that is consistent with democratic and civic values, that supports deliberation, and that elicits our sense of individual or collective agency rather than shutting it down. So do we have any models for what it could look like to cultivate fear in this way? I think we do. I'm going to suggest in my remaining few minutes that Aristotle offers the basis for a model of civic fear. And here I'm building on some of the work by a rhetoric scholar named Michael Fow. And the model of civic fear, I think, starts to guide us in some of the work we have to do to think more about how to fear well. Now, Aristotle recognizes that fear may indeed be salutary for a polity particularly in cases where the threat is spatially or temporally distant. For, as he says, what is far off is not feared, though it may certainly be dangerous. And in cases like this, communicators must bring distant fears near in order that citizens, as Aristotle put it, may be on their guard and like sentinels in a night watch, never relax their guard. In dealing with distant threats, communicators must emphasize the evidence or signs that the threatening outcome will obtain. Um, we must make the outcome seem near at hand. Now, this Aristotelian conception so far really affirms what many climate change uh, fear appeals already do. They emphasize the harmful and destructive impacts of climate change that are likely to affect their audience or those with whom they have close affective ties, their children, as Gore emphasizes. And they draw attention to the signs or observable evidence of these outcomes. They make the danger seem nearer at hand by stressing the local impacts it is already having and the impacts it's likely to have on generations currently living. But Aristotle, I think, is interestingly and usefully for us also particularly attentive to the danger of resignation. Fear is a painful emotion, and it's entirely possible that when presented with a fear appeal, instead of taking action to avert the threat, we may simply try to avert or escape the feeling of fear by telling ourselves that any actions we take will be futile. We replace our fear with the comforts of resignation. And to the resigned, the purveyor of fear must offer hope. And for Aristotle, it's the hope associated with fear, rather than fear itself, that encourages deliberation. So how does a communicator elicit this hope? At a minimum, she must offer some reason to think that it's possible, as Aristotle says, to be saved from the cause of the agony. For as he puts it, no one deliberates about hopeless things. She must portray the outcome as susceptible and responsive to human agency. But even more, she must portray the outcome as within the particular power of the individuals and the political collective she is addressing. For we deliberate about what is in our power, what we can do, and each group or polity deliberates about what they themselves can do, as Aristotle puts it. <laughs> 
Now, the empirical literature on both fear and hope stresses that the way to counteract resignation is to propose actions that are easy or that are well within the power of audiences to undertake. But of course, facing our collective fears squarely, especially in the climate change case, and preparing ourselves for the work of responding to them effectively <laughs> isn't, as we all know, always easy. And in order for an audience to be prepared to meet their fears without resignation, and for that matter, to hope without complacency, and to face the challenges that may be required for effective responses, perhaps they need to be imbued with a virtue to which Aristotle also gives substantial attention, with courage. So how is it that a climate change communicator can elicit courage from our audience? Well, one promising route would be to invite them to consider how they and their actions will be remembered by future generations. Churchill, of course, relied on this technique as he sought to steal his audience for the looming Battle of Britain. Let us brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Now, Obama attempted a similar rhetorical move when he invited his audience at the 2015 Paris Conference to undertake the kind of action that will elicit pride from future generations when they, as he put it, look back and they see what we did here. Of course, quickly now being unraveled. Um, now, there's some empirical support for the effectiveness of this rhetorical strategy. Preliminary experimental evidence suggests that being primed to think about one's legacy and how one will be remembered increases people's motivation to undertake difficult preventive actions on climate change. So I would suggest that even as they try to avoid engendering resignation, the purveyors of fear appeals might not need to hold back from inviting their audiences to respond in ways that may not always be easy. But they certainly must attend to the question of how best to steal their audiences to face these threats and the challenges of meeting them collectively. Now, to conclude, of course, the Aristotelian model of civic fear does not offer a complete template for affectively or emotionally engaged deliberation on climate change. What I hope it does offer is an appealing sketch of how we might begin to cultivate fear responsibly in a way that elicits rather than extinguishes agency and that invites rather than forecloses deliberation. So thank you. You'll see that in a very different vein this follows on what we've heard so far. While well, humans have survived floods and droughts throughout history, they've made improvements in their habitats or moved to more congenial ones. They've produced technological and social innovations like weather forecasting and insurance. And ad but adaptation in the current climate context, which often begins as a response to a disaster, is public policy. Hard armoring infrastructure or moving whole communities permanently from dangerous places. Adaptation entails political will and capacity. And to be sure, uh, to be clear, adaptation goes beyond pouring concrete. It's inseparable from the social ecology of communities. We know that extreme climate events, heat waves and floods, bring both physical disasters and secondary disasters that are rooted in longstanding inequalities and injustices. Hurricane Katrina did not affect all New Orleans residents similarly, and the long-term effects on poor people in the Lower Ninth Ward are very well documented and so is Superstorm Sandy's undemocratic wrath. From the perspective of accelerating effects of climate change on living species over the earth, adaptation can seem like a distraction. It has always seemed like a distraction to Al Gore, who wrote that adaptation represents a kind of laziness, an arrogant faith in our ability to react in time to save our skins. And it's true that mitigating for, uh, fossil fuel emissions is the ultimate adaptation. But mitigation without what I think of as ordinary adaptation is, I think, morally unthinkable. Decency requires us to defend vulnerable pe people against the worst. And in national uh, politics, adaptation is not humanitarian assistance. It's the purpose of government, as central as public order and security against external threats. 
Now, there are familiar political obstacles to adaptation. Uh, partisan polarization operates here, short-sightedness, professional turf battles, intergovernmental squabbling, the structure of politics and money. Uh, we could go on. Uh, my inquiry is motivated by the question of whether adaptation processes, which are going on and will, serve as a vehicle for heightened consciousness of climate change itself and for political action to save not just the neighborhood, but the human habitat. That is, whether adaptation is a way in or not. And I think that this depends in part on the mindset that we bring to it. So my talk is called Three Mindsets. And the first, echoing Allison, but I think in a different spirit, is adaptation as resignation. And you get a taste of it from Roy Scranton's book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. Have any of you read that? Reflections on the End of a Civilization. He says, we're fucked. The only question is how soon and how badly. And he prescribes detachment. The practice of learning to die in the, in the Anthropocene is learning to get, let go of hope. Right? That's the, the mindset of resignation. And it's all around us in people who have been studying climate change for a very long time. They, too many of them come to this conclusion. In Reason in a Dark Time, why the struggle against climate change failed and what it means for our future, moral philosopher Dale Jameson explains that we failed because evolution did not design us to solve or even to recognize this kind of problem. It overwhelms our cognitive and affective systems so that our everyday morality is flummoxed, silent, or incorrect. And he says we're going to have to learn to live with irre irreversible losses. Indeed, an extreme change may occur to which it's impossible to adapt. And climate scientists, interestingly, who've spent their careers studying species and extinction, have begun to express themselves in just this vein. It's very sad. In 2012, Camille Parmesan, who won a Nobel Prize with Al Gore for her climate work, publicly announced her personal and professional depression. I call this mindset resignation. These things are seem to have moved beyond terror uh, to a kind of grim acceptance. For them, the reasonable in this dark time uh, the adaptation available to them is uh, resignation. Now, starting from a similarly cold eye vision of advancing climate change, there's a mi another mindset that's very hopeful. I call it, and others have, species awareness. The signs that are authorizing hope aren't scientific reports of progress or, or uh, effective global cooperation, uh, but something else. Writers with this mindset of species awareness have a profound sense of the human capacity for survival. And this for them goes beyond biological imperatives. They have confidence in the human impulse to find meaning in our lives, and this meaning in our lives depends on connecting to the human world and to the human world continuing beyond our lifetimes. And so for them, the main business of adaptation is coming to see ourselves as part of this creative species entity. Adaptation is a matter of species awareness, and that's the necessary step for actions to protect the human habitat. Now, this mindset isn't exactly indifferent to local measures of physical and social adaptation. We should pay some attention to the Marshall Islands or to Miami. Still, adaptation commensurate with climate change, adaptation that goes beyond triage, is this emerging species awareness. Now, like the effects of climate change itself, adaptation is local. And this brings me to the third and most common mindset. And then I'm going to bring these back to you. And that is uh, that the aim of adaptation is to recover from loss and the disruption of everyday life and return to a normal state. Saving lives and stemming damage in the emergency, that's the starting point. And that's the aim of adaptation altogether. And the normalizing mindset is obviously right in attending to emergency response. You've read some of you, I hope, Elaine Scarry's great book on thinking in, emerg in an emergency. And they're right. We should have a self-conscious, habitual way of thinking in an emergency. We want assurances of some equality of survival. But the normalizing mindset goes beyond this. And uh, its watchword is this word that you read everywhere now in the climate literature. The watchword is resilience. It evokes a sort of capacity to resist and to absorb and to bounce back from disturbances. Resilience is imbued with a moral tinge, toughness, and fortitude. In all of the publications, which I unfortunately read, put out by New York City, describing their adaptation plans, resilience is, is, all, is the watchword, right? New Yorkers have a can-do attitude. The plan avows that New York cannot and will not retreat, meaning, meaning that New York will continue to develop low-lying waterfront areas with developers, right? We, we will, as de Blasio puts it, we will embrace our coastline. 
managed retreat or strategic withdrawal are politically toxic. They evoke surrender. And so resiliency is in our DNA as a city. And this normalizing mindset is built into federal climate policy. The Army Corps of Engineers budget goes mostly to storm repairs. FEMA is basically a replacement law. It provides assistance for repair and replacement of public infrastructures and small business loans and loans to local governments to replace lost tax revenue. And the, inf the in incentives to build better or requirements that the state is zoned to prohibit building in vulnerable areas and so on are not standard. And Congress has been as resistant to adaptation as it's been to the larger question of mitigation. Attempts by the military to develop climate change plans have met fierce resistance an effort by the Pentagon to appoint officers to take charge of climate resilience led to a House vote prohibiting taxpayer money from being spent on the plan. Tangier Island and Chesapeake Bay sinking into oblivion is a bit of evidence that adaptation can't be reduced to normalizing recovery. And we know, and this goes along with what some of you were saying, we know that even for people whose lives have been deranged by a climate event have no direct root from to climate awareness or from climate awareness to political activism. Their first preoccupation is surviving and then the long arduous business of recovery. They want to get things as nearly as possible back to the way they were as quickly as possible. The survivors prefer getting back to normal over living creatively with the natural environment. And we all are quoting Carrie Norgard's book, uh, which is a really a stunning story of a Norwegian village that suffered loss of snow and with it income from tourism, right, which was their way of life. The book is called Living in Denial. And what she do documents is that villagers rarely spoke of the change. They took no action and they accepted it with feelings of helplessness. helplessness. I think it would be go going too far to say that the normalizing mindset is always blinkered or suffers from amnesia from one disaster to another or entirely disregards the limitations of immediate protective measures. But it is correct to say that this normalizing mindset tends to be piecemeal and that it can be an impediment to learning beyond the particulars of the limited experience to climate awareness. Indeed, it turns out that you can accept quite a lot of adaptation without acknowledging climate change at all. Miami, which is now referred to as the New Atlantis, is engaged in elevating street levels elevating street levels, installing pumping stations, improving drainage, worrying about the consequences of changes on insurance and mortgages and property values in the whole local economy. At the same time, the Governor Scott does not accept human-caused warming and has ordered officials in no document are they allowed to use the terms climate change or global warming. So you can have adaptation without the larger awareness. Now, for the scientists and historians and philosophers and planners that I've cited so far, these mindsets of resignation or hope or normalization are an element now of their intellectual and moral identity. Uh, we share these mindsets, or so I argue, with this difference that our awareness is unformed and fragmented. And that means that our awareness of the climate threats that necessitate adaptation are sporadic, they're ephemeral. The set in mindset is misleading, is applied to us. And fragmented and unformed also means that we experience all of these mindsets, or so I argue, resignation and something like hopeful species awareness and normalization at one moment or another. Uh, these are partial considerations for us and we cycle through them. So most of us had ha have had a moment when we glimpse the existential danger and perhaps uh, but because of a village, uh, vi uh, visual image of a melting glacier or people on the rooftops of New Orleans, we've been sort of stopped and struck and we have maybe a little shiver of fear and we have the sense that the problem is too big for us to grasp and, we, and the dread is too disorienting and so we don't settle into resignation. Simply the moment when we think to ourselves we're doomed is an unformed, fragmented, ephemeral awareness. And then at another moment of awareness we have the possibility of catastrophe is accompanied for us by a sense of hope that human, humans have the will and imagination to survive and we appreciate, appreciate our mutual vulnerability and so on. But that moment, too, is intermittent. It doesn't propel us to commit to persistent political action, to divest Harvard or to science marches or advocacy groups or electoral politics. We don't even make it a regular part of our work as scholars or put it into our curriculum as teachers. The mindset we're most likely to bring to it is normalization. We see an emergency. We think that we have to recoup from it. 
But even this mindset is uh, fragmented, I think. Our memories are short. We don't experience a sustained connection to similar events in other places or around the world. And I think that normalization is the default state of mind at moments when we have a state of mind about this matter at all. If we think that normalization is inadequate and project the need for sometimes radical physical but also social and political change, if we think that adaptation, which is actually going on all around us and we can see, has to connect to some sense of the long-term climate change, to species awareness, to some, um, uh, then the question becomes what kind of response or recovery or planning and activism encourages that. And so that's the political question that I've come to. Can adaptation become a path, not the only one, perhaps, but a critical one, into a kind of formed climate awareness and action? Because the ultimate adaptation is going to be mitigation. Neither factual information nor oral arguments nor, it seems, personal experience with extreme weather events speak for themselves, and they don't by themselves motivate action. Perhaps the politics of adaptation is a way in. That's my question. Because large-scale mitigation projects at the national or state level are remote. They're the domain of remote authorities and of political elites and of technocrats. Adaptation, by contrast, is rooted locally and close to home. It calls on communities' social and material resources and acting together to alter how we live where we live. And the process of adaptation planning and implementation is amenable to more than consultation with people. It is potentially participatory. Can that give the climate problem salience? Can it animate more than superficial engagement? Can it create a core political constituency over the space and time for mitigation? Um, I think the participation in what I'm thinking of is the process of planning and implementation of adaptation in our towns and cities is justifiable on democratic grounds. But what I'm trying to suggest here that is that it's, it's also potentially a matter of moral psychology, of mindset, whether there's a path from the normalizing adaptation to formed and unfragmented climate awareness. That's the question. Can democratic theory help here? Can you help me, really, is what I'm asking. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Who's got, why don't we start right in the back there? Yeah. So this is a, okay, a point to Alison and potentially also to Eric. Uh, Alison, in response to the claim that uh, fear vitiates the quality of, was it democracy or democratic liberation? You give the response, well, um, if, we, if through fear we block off some views, uh, there is still room for a lot of deliberation about which of the other options we go for. That seems to me like the wrong answer to that uh, worry. If I block off, uh, in, a, in the McCarthy example, some political parties and say, oh, but there, you can still choose between the other political parties. That's not supposed to be good enough. Um, Two better responses, in my view. One is maybe the quality of democratic liberation is less important when we're talking about saving the universe from melting. Uh, and another response is maybe what fear does is, or maybe we can control the fear factor <coughs> such that what it will do is make somebody who was reasoning badly reason rationally, deliberate rationally. Here's what I have in mind. So the I have the factor that makes me be in denial or not take into account uh, uh, enough of the information that is out there and um, um, for that reason hold the wrong beliefs. The fa that factor which holds me back is uh, somebody else was scaring me or my, I, I love my party too much and I'm partisan or institutional corruption or whatnot, my vested interests. Um, what the fear does is merely to force me to think well on this topic. And then I'll proceed, and in fact, because there is great evidence that this is uh, a danger to all of us, I will most likely wind up having the correct view and everything will go all right. But um, basically what the fear does is a sort of 
Jungian kind of a rational factor interceding against uh, in, in the context of somebody who is not re reasoning well and putting them back on track to reasoning well. Good, yeah, no, so let me start by saying I, I realize the, the response on the, um, on the question of, of deliberation is, is at this point a pretty minimal response, so it does run into the, the difficulty you present. It's, it's in part meant to be an intervention into what I think is a very unhelpful tendency in the fear appeal literature to think that there's something, that it, there's a necessary feature of fear appeals that they all in some way have to, have to look like the example of McCarthyism, right? That you, you juxtapose one terrifying threat with, with a, a single um, option. I mean, in a way, it's the kind of Hobbes strategy, right? It's like that as if all fear appeals had to juxtapose, say, the terror of the state of nature with the only stable solution to it being the absolutist state. And I, I don't think that most fear appeals, in fact, do work that way. And there's at least room for quite a bit of deliberation about the question of which uh, responses may be better, uh, better or worse for responding to the threat. But it, it does, it you know, I th you're right to point to the, the minimalism of that claim, and then it may not fully satis satisfy us on uh, responding to, the, to that uh, worry. I'd be very reluctant to say that on, on issues of this kind of consequence that the quality of deliberation is, is less import that important. I think that, that would be a last resort option. But I, I totally agree with you on the, on the second point, and that's what I have in mind in responding to the worry about manipulation as well. I mean, I think we typically think about fear-mongering, right, as, um, as inculcating irrational fears, and that's precisely not what's going on in the climate change case. You can make a really good case, as you did, that fear appeals are actually helping um, their targets to reason more rationally and to, to improve the quality of deliberation. That, that, that may be the hope. I, I think that's entirely right, and I, am, I embrace that. And the deliberative worry I have is that the polarization bias has reared its head when you put citizens together to discuss simply the facts about climate change. Uh, they will, when exposed to evidence, um, further, <laughs> further respond, respond with greater credence in the, in the beliefs that they showed up with. Um, so it's still alive there. And I would want to know whether if you prime them in the way that some of the studies I mentioned to think about a range of policy options that they're not yeah. peeking downstream at what might lead them to uh, policies that they would regret because they're committed to <laughs> opposing those policies, whether that would then alter, would, would it uh, neutralize the, the polarization bias in this kind of setting or not. Uh, that also, that's not been done. Yeah, thank you for really fascinating talks. Uh, again, about the notion of fear. Um, we, we talk a lot about the way now that fear of immigration, for example, motivate people for action. And I wonder if you can do some sort of uh, an attempt to categorize fears, fears that motivate people for action and fears that paralyzes people. And whether you have any thoughts about uh, why these kind of fears are paralyzing and the others are motivating. And is there any um, literature, this is actually asking advice, that can distinguish productive, so to speak, fears from non-productive ones? Yeah, so there's there's some good social science uh, literature that uh, so I broke down um, a fear appeal in the beginning by saying that a that a fear appeal basically does two sets of things. It convinces us there's a, there's a a threat that it's severe and we're susceptible to it. So that's the threat side, and then it tries to convince us some, of some um, st stuff that we might put on the efficacy side. That there are responses we can take. That there are responses that can be taken that are likely to be effective and um, that those responses are within our power to undertake. Now, what, the, what some of the social science literature seems to suggest is that fear appeals that are paralyzing um, or that engender a sense of resignation succeed on the threat dimension and fail on the efficacy dimension. And so they, they convince us that there's a threat, um, that we are, that it's severe, that we're susceptible to it. Um, but they, they fail on convincing us of one or both of the following, that there are responses that can be undertaken that are effective and that those responses are within our power to undertake. 
And I, I think a reasonable hypothesis about the, ca the case of climate change fear appeals is that they are failing on those, those latter um, two dimensions. The suggestion in the social science is that when um, fear appeals fail on those latter two dimensions, um, instead of taking action to avert the danger, people just take action to manage the fear. Um, and so they will, for instance, maybe um, question the facts. Um, and Eric gave us some, some instances of what that uh, can look like. Or they just convince themselves there's nothing they can do, and they, they replace fear with, uh, with resignation. Um, and I think that is the, the crucial stumbling block in the, in the climate change case that's not there, for instance, in, in, in other cases of fear appeals. If you had a science model that gave you uh, two plausible answers of uh, how high you would raise the stakes, and they both were in the range of the model, I wonder if there'd be a threshold effect. So there's a certain tipping point beyond which the stakes are raised so high, it creates the very uh, feeling of efficacy you're worried about. And so that would give us reasons to consider actually making the stakes somewhat lower. This relates to Nancy's yeah. view about whether when you mention adaptation, do you lower the stakes almost implicitly? when you put it on the table. Well, you, well, you're presenting people with something that's local and potentially manageable. Mm -hmm. That is, they, they are going to lower the streets in mm -hmm. Miami, and shouldn't you participate through your neighborhood organization in doing that? And d can that then lead you to a wider uh, climate consciousness? And can I, they see some immediate effects well, going as to, well they're going from to see, participation? They're going to see immediate, yeah. they're going to see immediate changes. Um, yeah, in the black vest there. Thank you. I, um, thinking about in terms of uh, political realism, if, if we suppose ultimately cared about whether the Senate ratified a given treaty or whether uh, the president removes uh, a country from uh, a climate change body, and if so, if that's the ultimate interest of these sorts of persuasion studies, I wonder to what extent the individual policy views of of citizens are, are the right question to be asking. I mean, I think Eric nicely parsed, well, if you asked a slightly different question, you might get a different answer. But I don't even know whether those answers are what matters to the political realism of, of policy outcomes. Because it seems that, especially in a, in a republic or, or you know, with a, a representational government, we're not asking the individuals to vote on some arcane referendum. Instead, there's this weird bundling that goes along with you know, what do you think gun rights has to do with climate change? I have no idea, but they, apparently they do, and they've been bundled in a way and then wrapped around particular, particular candidates with, with what seem to be much more personality appeals than, than careful policy questions. So I, I, is there any literature on that bundling and, and um, that decision-making process that would make these sorts of questions the right questions to be exploring? Yeah, I mean, the... The question of, yeah, the structure and the, and the range, the softness of these views, you might think, won't matter as long as, long as the partisan divide uh, is so strong and, and even tracks scientific knowledge in the way I began with. Um, I guess what I, what I view as being useful is I think that um, when you just think about activities as basic as a campaign speech or how to frame an issue that way, um, I, I just think now the, the kind of binary of, of using denier to describe 70 percent of Congress, one third of Americans are represented by deniers. I don't think that's, it's pretty clear that's not working as a term, the way it kind of creates people to um, be incredibly self-defensive. And, and so if we start to see that they're actually under that umbrella, there are quite a range of, of relationships to reality, uh, that that is, is the kind of thing that a, a party trying to be more inclusive on climate activism needs to take seriously. Um, so I don't have a story of how that then is solved by, by the fact that we have these, these big omnibus bills that Congress passes that are bundled in that way. Uh, I don't think this is an answer to that, uh, but if you if you found a way to, to pull out of the traditional party ideologies of the policy solutions and imagine a, a kind of bill that cut across left and right in, in solutions, I mean, that would be the kind of thing that would, uh, would be a candidate, but it's, it's not a very... Uh, I'm, I'm gonna just answer. seize the opportunity yeah. ganted by you're talking about political realism. And there is sometimes the question whether all of this moral psychology that we're discussing and wanting to have better views and views that lead to mobilization, how much it matters. That is, <laughs> climate change and the fossil fuel industry is one of the big areas in which <laughs> money and politics are so interwoven. And, and in, in political decision-making, it's bipartisan. 
right, these yeah. people who, who are supporting this. So the question is, at what point can popular mobilization make a dent in what we're seeing there? And I think it would have to be not, not public opinion polling. It has to be real political organizing and making these things salient, salient in a way that healthcare has suddenly, suddenly been. And, you know, I'm going back to this adaptation question because I'm, I'm trying to think really of where it is that people can get involved in this in a way that makes it important to them and that is a, is a, a, a political ground for organizing. That's all. Um, yeah, La Larry? So Eric, I really love this uh, distinction. Um, if we can, par we can map it to um, you know, believers and, and atheists and agnostics. Um, um, and, and I wonder, is there any way to try to recover data about the breakdown between, depends on which way you look at this, I'm thinking atheists versus agnostics, in this debate over time? Because what's, of course, obvious is as a strategy for affecting people's um, beliefs, the strategy of the industry has always been to produce agnostics. Um, you just try to put up enough FUD and uncertainty so people have to move to the place of, I'm not really sure anymore. And then when you ask them the binary question, they might you know, jump to one side or the other, but for exactly the reasons you're talking about that, they're not really sure about that. Um, and, and so if we do have data about what that breakdown looks like over time, it might feed um, an understanding of how you might repair or un undercut the agnostic uh, category. That was my hope, that we could find data like that. And I'll, I'll continue to search for it. But as far as I can tell now, we, we don't. And so obviously the, the idea was to be more optimistic about the agnostics, about the disbelievers. Uh, but because insofar as they're identifying falsely with atheists, there's more flexibility. Um, and I suspect that, uh, that it, it looks like a, a potentially a substantive group, but I just don't see a, a way to get it. Now we could, something we could test for. But then your response is, uh, it, victory might be with disbelief. You know, how much is gained to bring it, to convince someone to become a card-carrying atheist? And that, that goes against my hope, right? Um, here. I'll, I'll get you, I'll get you, I promise. No, but I promise. Uh, sorry, for, uh, Francis. Uh, yeah. And uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Eric. And as of, you know, I, I think the, the suggestions are all very, you know, uh, um, important, interesting. But still, I, I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to acknowledge that all this sort of internal tinkering eventually wouldn't work, you know, uh, because I mean, think about uh, the Churchill. You know, I mean, he says, you know, let's think about history and things like that. But it's in World War II, they're going to be killed, you know. So it's the fear is immediate. And the, the problem of climate change is that the fear is not immediate. I mean, uh, however you like to blow up, you know, the, the fear, you know, it's, it's hard to, to make it as uh, much as, you know, in World War II. So maybe that kind of rhetoric, uh, courage, all those things couldn't work. And uh, so, uh, you know, because, I mean, the sort of a uh, popular uh, uh, democracy, you know, is it's, it's based on the assumption that we are rational, but we're only rational about immediate, immediate fear at best. Right, and uh, another th uh, issue is, uh, you know, it's uh, about sort of the the, uh, the problem is caused by all of us, but uh, the people who suffer are always sort of minority, like the Norwegian uh, village people, and uh, and then when the uh, when you know also the voting is within a state, so you know uh, maybe the vi village people couldn't do much about changing the voters in America or in other countries that cause their, their problems. So maybe those problems are fundamental. You know, you, you can do all the tinkering, then the fundamental problems are still there and you can, you can solve from within. I just remember the moment in The Inconvenient Truth when I saw it for the first time when Al Gore decided to show uh, the most extreme model where the glaciers had melted by 2020, I believe. If it's, mm -hmm. And that was a choice he had to make, right, to raise the stakes that high that soon. And you might think, well, that's responding again, to our bias of short-termism, but my suggestion at the end, which was completely conjecture, was if you raise the stakes that high, there may be a threshold beyond which you actually then cause inaction. And it was, in that case, discretionary. It wasn't that he was drawing upon a false model, but he was looking at the outer edges of it. And should he have? That's a question that this would bear upon. But it, it's not meant to 
make any more sanguine your despair. I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, also raising the raising the stakes too high in that that case can create problems of distrust and can dis discredit the cause as well. I mean, so Al Gore is seen to to bear quite a bit of responsibility for, <laughs> for justly or unjustly for yes. some of the failures yeah, of the climate change the movement right. for precisely that well, reason. Yes, Bro bring both mics to Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Stereo. I can speak out of the two sides of my mouth. No, what I what I wanted to know was, um, well, first of all, why do you think that, uh, Allison, that manipulation, your response, this is along the line of Nears' questions, really, you said the response to the manipulation point was that, well, manipulation is usually eliciting biases. In this case, it's overcoming biases. That doesn't mean it's not manipulation. I mean, if somebody shows me, manipulation is a mechanism. So if someone has a bias against Muslims, and all they do is present me with pictures of positive images of Muslims, uh, you know, so that the ordinary range of types of people, good and bad, is not presented, that's manipulative. So I, I just don't think that this is an adequate response to not, you know, to the manipulation issue. Uh, that overcoming bias can be manipulative. But, but this relates to the other thing. I mean, there is this issue about why people might not fear what's, you know, distant and will affect others far beyond those they're connected to. Um, it's that the non-identity problem, philosophers have referred to it as, you know, there isn't anybody who's going to be harmed by global warming, and there isn't going to be anybody that's going to be benefited by the climate not being improved. Why, you might say? Because depending on the adaptation or mitigation mechanisms we use, there are going to be a whole different set of people. The people who would have existed if we hadn't mitigated aren't going to exist if we do. And the people who will exist if we mitigate, you know, you can see this, what's happening here. Uh, none of them, all right, would have been better off if we hadn't mitigated, if we, if we do mitigate, none of them. Sorry, none of them will be better off if we uh, do mitigate because they wouldn't have existed if we, you know, didn't mitigate. And the people who will, you know, uh, come to exist with lower temp with higher temperatures, they wouldn't have been better off if we had done something good because, again, they wouldn't have existed. I don't know if I put presented this correctly. The point is, you've got different populations that will exist. And I have been asked on occasions not to mention this fact because it makes it seem less problematic to people. Oh, you mean no one's going to be harmed? No, no one will probably be harmed. No one's going to be benefited? This is what's called a non-person affecting problem. And so people say, if you mention that, people are going to become less worried. Would you mind not mentioning it? Now, I consider that manipulative behavior. Uh, obviously, it's, it it's eliminating a truth for the purpose of producing a certain effect, yeah. okay? So I just want to say that I think there's manipulation going on here, and this truth may actually be relevant. It's one of the inconvenient truths, right, <laughs> that very often does not get mentioned. And you have to deal with the problem of non-person affecting harms. I'm just saying that I haven't met, heard that mentioned very often in this discussion, or anywhere. It gets suppressed. Okay, let me focus on the on the manipulation point. I mean, so some of this would hinge on how we define manipulation. So if we think of manipulation as power that's that's exercised deceptively in a way to change um, someone's pre-existing will, um, then we might we might think that there's a problem either way, whether their pre-existing view is is rational or irrational. Um, but if we think of manipulation, or if at least we think of the, the, if we want to distinguish between more or less problematic kinds by, by saying that the, the more problematic would be to uh, replace and otherwise, uh, using power deceptively to, to replace an otherwise, you know, um, rational view of the state of affairs with an irrational one in the case of the fear mongering to do with uh, violent crime in the 1990s that would look a lot like that if we contrast that between a case where we'd actually be using power perhaps deceptively to um, to correct for existing biases to change um, some existing views that are irrational um, 
it may be the case that we want to call both manipulation, but then distinguish um, between each of those as a as a moral we matter. Have to decide whether the good consequences were worth the implicitly wrong or prima facie wrong means. Yes. And different people will have to. And different. That. Yes. And so there's room for a lot more nuance in that claim that, that, that is there in a longer a longer paper and was not there in the in the presentation. So you're entirely right about that. And let me just add one more worry that we might have. Even if we're correct even if we're using fear appeals to correct for views that are false or irrational to correct for cognitive biases, um, that we still have to worry about what how those tactics appear to the to the people at whom they're being targeted. And no one has so far on this panel talked much about some of the problems of trust in the, in the climate change debate. So even when you're using fear appeals uh, to correct for existing biases, you still have to worry about how those kinds of tactics look to the people at whom they're, they're targeted. Um, we already have enough problem with a lack of trust in, in experts on, um, on this issue. So, so I, take, I take the force of some of these worries, but I'd want to insist that uh, that the worry about fear mongering here, that we should, we should be making some moral distinctions between the different ways in which fear appeals should be used. Um, as for the second point, I, I'm going to leave that one on the, on the table for now, Francis. I don't want to live in a world where Francis Cam is not allowed to bring up the non-identity problem. No. Whenever it's a price. <laughs> but uh, one way to dissolve your dilemma is that you present some pretty attractive solutions. The Rahul Kumar's solution, Lucas Danchik has a solution in the works. Uh, that's part of our, our job is to raise it, but then show that uh, it, uh, there are ways we can wrong people without harming them uh, that, are, uh, that work very well for non-consequentialists. For consequentialists, it might be harder, but that's not my problem. <laughs> I think our, our time is up, and I think Danielle wants to bid us goodbye, so. <laughs> This is just another moment to say thanks, really, to all our fellows for coming back and all our speakers and everybody for participating. We spent a lot of time over the last two and a half days um, reflecting explicitly about 30 years ago when everything got started. And so it feels like it might be worth thinking a little bit about 30 years from now. Um, and so I'm not going to, be, I'll be 75 30 years from now. I'm, I'm not going to answer the Atlantic editor's question of whether I hope to die at 75. <laughs> I'm not even going to answer Zeke's question about whether or not I'll decide to refuse antibiotics at 75. Very different questions. Um, but I think it probably is worth um, saying something about what would be my wish list for things that we have answers to 30 years from now. And I imagine that every single person in this room has such a wish list. And I know that, that each of those lists will be different from mine. So I'll also make a request that after this conference, you can go ahead and email us. Um, your, your wish list, and we could gather those wish lists. I think that would be very valuable for us to have. Um, so I'll just throw out some of the ones that are on mine. So, and I'm, I'm partly borrowing phrases that I've heard from people over the course of the last two and a half days as well. So I, I think it would be great if in 30 years we had a model for egalitarian intersectional democracy that was connected to an egalitarian intersectional political economy that had rebalanced the way we pay attention to, say, the lower third, middle third, and, and upper income people. The thirds aren't the right distributions. But in other words, the issue of reintegrating the middle into a picture of a just economy, but one that doesn't uh, lose the social questions, the issues of race, domination, that sort of thing, doesn't lose those questions, partly by recognizing them as themselves economic questions, so that the social and the economic can be integrated in a picture, again, as I said, of an egalitarian intersectional democracy connected to an egalitarian intersectional political economy. I would personally hope, as well, for functional governance institutions, just pointing to Larry's point here, that can deliver on that model of egalitarian intersectional democracy, um, and thereby earn deserved credibility. And of course, achieving that requires dealing with the corruption issues, the conflict of interest issues that Larry has been so consistently raising. Um, I would also hope for a culture and a policy regime of adaptation, where did Nancy go, um, within which framework mitigation is the ultimate adaptation. That seems like something that we would want those functional <laughs> governance institutions that are securing an egalitarian intersectional democracy to achieve. And I would also hope that by 30 years from now, universities would have solved the problem <laughs> of how to build 
um, expertise that earns, deservedly earns, and maintains, again, credibility, a trust. That seems partly about improving our ability to listen, to Joyce's point, I don't know where Joyce is right now, um, listen as a part of the research process so that our inputs are epistemically um, themselves egalitarian. Um, but of course, that hard work of investment in research does mean that we have a responsibility of dissemination of a kind. That's it's not, it's not just all about listening. But so then how is it that we do talk and share and even sometimes indirectly <laughs> influence um, the culture abroad um, generally? Uh, but it's, you know, if universities haven't reversed the course of this dynamic by 30 years from now, um, we will have seriously failed at our own mission. So I, I, just, I do want us to say that out loud. Although, as I say, sort of projecting forward to 30 years, I also am um, you know, struck in a very you know, way that makes me feel very weird and uncomfortable by the fact that, that the piece of rhetoric from Churchill that we hold up as an example actually projected a thousand year continuance of the British Empire. <laughs> Did everybody notice that? Like, in what year was he doing that in? So, <laughs> even if, okay, at any rate, so obviously projections for the future are dangerous for all kinds of reasons, among them the kinds of illusions that we have about ourselves. And so I suppose if that is a sort of final thing I'm taking away from this is just um, the degree to which sort of we in the academy probably do need to figure out what are the sort of illusions about, that we have about ourselves that are hindering us from achieving the aspirations that we so clearly um, articulate when we come together. Um, I want to conclude by invoking um, our most important honor roll once again. Susan, are you in here this time? So, oh, I still don't have Susan. Is Susan around somewhere? Uh, Susan Cox, let me want to thank our director of events, Susan Cox, our director of, and associate uh, director of administration, Monica Tesoriero, um, Jess Minor, our research director, I think I saw Jess, um, uh, uh, Maggie Gates, have we, do we have Maggie in here? See, this is the thing, everybody is working so hard, but I can't, it's very hard to thank people. Kyle Hecht was running microphones and doing many other things for us. Tomer Perry, there's Tomer, thank you. Emily Bromley, sorry, where did, I, where did Emily go? Also, also doing things on our behalf. At any rate, I've said it before, but you all know that we can't do any of these things without the tremendous people working with us every day. They've been working very hard for a year, planning these events for these two and a half days. It's been a joy. We've all had our moments of frustration. We hope that the balance in this conference has been 99% joy and 1% frustration. If that, it has been truly phenomenal to work with my colleagues, and we hope that you've all enjoyed the fruits of our labors. Thank you.